well, Mrs. Ambassador, Mr. President of the uh, Organizing Societies in Medicine and in Science, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here today in Helsinki and to give a talk about uh, Louis Pasteur. And I've entitled my presentation uh, Between uh, Myth and, and Reality. No doubt that Louis Pasteur is a hero, as um, Le Saint, as shown here, as the angel of extermination of radis, or as an immortal icon, as shown after uh, his death. He's a hero, there is no French person who has his figure on the stamps of many countries all over the world, like uh, those, and this is just a, a small number of, of stamps, there are plenty of others. And also he has his name. Uh, for example, in France, there are 3,300 uh, 3, cities who have, which have a, a, pastor, a, a pastor street. But not only in France, you have in, in, in Vietnam, in Mexico, in Algeria, and even in, in Boston. This is Avenue Louis Pasteur, and this Avenue Louis Pasteur is where this Harvard University a, a Medical School is. And we have also this Pasteur uh, railway station, which is in fact in Buenos Aires. He is also the hero in some movie, and there were two movies, one uh, with uh, Sacha Guitry uh, as the uh, hero, and the other one the next year in 1836 uh, in, in the States with uh, Paul Muni, uh, who got the Oscar for uh, his interpretation of, of Louis Pasteur. Of course, he has his statues. No, more, no less than three statues of Louis Pasteur are in Paris, one in Place de Breteuil, one at the Institut Pasteur, and one uh, at the Sorbonne. There are also many statues all around the country. Uh, of course, each time inauguration were major events, like this one in Lille in uh, 1899, and other uh, statues in places where he has been working, or where he's born, or where he has been uh, spending his uh, childhood time. There are also statues uh, in other countries, uh, you have that, this one in Chicago, uh, this was in Kunur in India, in Mexico City, in Montreal, in Bogota. Interestingly, I just realized that this one in Chicago was inaugurated by one of the three kids. I heard that they were kids coming from Finland, but they were also kids coming from the States, from New Jersey, to get the vaccine uh, of Louis Pasteur. And that statue was inaugurated by one of, the, uh, of these kids later on <coughs> as an adult. So, First, we start with a legend. And the legend started thanks to his son-in-law, René Valéry Radeau, who uh, wrote in 1883, uh, Mr. Pasteur, the story of a, a scientist by an ignorant. Uh, to be honest, this book has been uh, made under the dictation of Louis Pasteur. And the second book he wrote is The Life of Louis Pasteur in 1900. The co other contributor to the legend is uh, Émile Duclos. Émile Duclos was his collaborator, and he succeeded Louis Pasteur at the head of Institut Pasteur, and uh, he, he wrote this book, Pasteur, Histoire d'un Esprit. Then the reality appeared when uh, his nephew published uh, his book In the Shadow of Louis Pasteur. And in this book, you learn a lot of information that so far have been um, hidden by those who were building the legend. And most interestingly, uh, the, the publication of his correspondence by his grandson. Here you see his grandson when he was a, a kid with Louis Pasteur and as an adult. And can you imagine that between 1840 to 1895, all correspondence by Louis Pasteur were copied by his wife. So that's why we have access to all what the letters sent by Pasteur were uh, uh, in a collection. But most interestingly, the published correspondence of Pasteur is redacted from a certain number of documents and with certain letters from certain passages so as not to affect the legend. So now, in fact, there are quite a few letters that now we can rediscover which in fact provide a new light on, on the life of Louis Pasteur, but his grandson avoid, uh, avoided to, to put them in this collection of correspondence. And then uh, are the laboratory notebook of, of Louis Pasteur, and once again the grandson uh, play a major role. René Valéry Lado was told by Pasteur, never show my laboratory notebook to anyone. 
1964, his grandson gave, uh, to, made a donation to the National French Library uh, in 1964, and uh, he said that those could be uh, open to uh, be studied and have access after his own death. So then it was possible to study and to try to make a link between the legend and the laboratory notebook. And the main player in this story is Gerald Jason. He was professor of history of science at Princeton University and could uh, study the, the cahier uh, of, uh, of Louis Pasteur and all these notebooks and all the notes that were in, in these uh, laboratory notebooks. And finally, uh, he wrote the private science of Louis Pasteur. And for that book, he, he got in 1996 uh, the um, William Welsh Medal for uh, his book uh, by the American Association for the History of Medicine. Uh, and I was told that at the Pasteur Institute Pasteur Library, the, there was a major question, can we get that book in our library or we leave it outside of the Institute Pasteur? <laughs> but most interestingly uh, is this text you can find in the obituary uh, Louis Pasteur when he passed away in 1895. And this is a very interesting statement. Pasteur is regarded as the father of modern bacteriology. But we must remember that he was not a pioneer in these lines of work. There was hardly a problem that he studied which has not been already recognized and even studied to a greater or less extent by his predecessors. And in fact, what a, an interesting statement in this, uh, in this uh, obituary was, others discovered facts, Pasteur determined laws. I like also to quote Jean Rostand. Jean Rostand is a very, very famous uh, French historian uh, of science, uh, an historian, uh, a scientist by himself. He said, it's commonly believed in the public that it was Pasteur who discovered the role of microbes in the production of infectious disease. In truth, this, is considerable, this considerable discovery does not belong to him, but belongs to another French scientist, Davenne, who was the first to dare to affirm and was able to demonstrate that by experimental method that a microorganism is the agent responsible for a disease. And that work was from Gamzimi Davenne in 1863, when he studied uh, sheep uh, with uh, anthrax he could see the microbes within the blood of these sick animals and injected the blood of these sheep, uh, sick sheep into rabbits, uh, transmit the disease uh, and the death. Now, uh, in an, another aspect of interesting uh, to build the reality is this preface that Joseph Grandchot, who has been mentioned earlier, was the one who was uh, making the vaccine, uh, vaccination of the kids or of the adults. Uh, uh, Joseph Grandchot wrote uh, a preface uh, on this book, Études sur les virus, by Jean Hameau. Jean Hameau was a medical doctor in Arcachon uh, area, and he was an amazing visionary. And he, he mentioned everything which will be later on demonstrated by Louis Pasteur was already considered by Jean Hameau. And in his preface, Joseph Branchet wrote, but Germany had already surpassed us in microbial technique. And Mr's laboratory, faithful to culture in liquid media, neglected the art of coloring microbes and that of cultivating them on solid media. It was Mr. Babesh, who uh, was a Romanian scientist, who, uh, coming from Germany, made known in France, in Mr. Cornet's laboratory, the methods of staining microbes then in use in Mr. Koch's laboratory. And we know that between Pasteur and Koch, then we are not truly fri friends. So, to be honest, the main discovery of Louis Pasteur that was really original is the work on molecular chirality, on molecular uh, asymmetry. And you have to be aware that Pasteur, as it has been mentioned, was a chemist first, and formed as a chemist. And uh, he realized that tartrate deflects polarized light, not paratartrate, and came to this concept uh, of uh, uh, molecular uh, uh, asymmetry. And the, the, the great chemist of that time, like Jean-Baptiste Bio in France, or William Gottlieb Hunkel in Germany, or Elart Mitscherslich in, in Germany, uh, truly admit, uh, admire this discovery. And um, uh, Mitscherlich said to Pasteur, you saw what I could not find. 
So clearly that was the main discovery of, of Louis Pasteur. But then, of course, as you know, he moved to another field, it's particularly the alcoholic fermentation, writing uh, the, 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 this book, uh, uh, his memory on the fermentation. And one of the key observations of Louis Pasteur was that yeast involved in fermentation was uh, uh, an animal nature. But he was not the first one to say that, as I said, many precursors before Pasteur. The first one to um, recognize, probably not that it was in animal nature, but to draw them, to see them under the microscope, was in 1680, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, who was in fact the very first scientist to see bacteria. But also uh, in Italy, Adamo Fabroni, uh, in France, uh, Louis-Jacques Thénard, uh, Theodore Schwann. By the way, Schwann was the only one who was well recognized by Pasteur to be one of his precursors. Uh, in, still in Germany, Kutzing, uh, in France, uh, Charles Kenyard de Latour, and, in, and again in France, uh, Pierre-Jean-François Turpin. All those people had kind the concept that yeast was animal in nature. The other, which were opponents to uh, Pasteur, were, for example, uh, in, in, in Germany, uh, von Liebing. I, I put this, it's a soup, but I don't know if in, in Finland you have that kind of soup, but in France we have Liebig, and Liebig is very well known, not as a scientist, but as a soup. Uh, and uh, uh, so Liebig worked together with Waller, and, and they were supporting the idea that fermentation was a mechanical process. They had no experimental evidence to refute the cellular basis of fermentation. Instead, they, restore, uh, they resorted to polemical mockery. And they published in the Annalen de Chemie uh, and Pharmacy, of, all, uh, of which both were editor-in-chief. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think this is what is known nowadays as the incestuous links between scientists uh, and the scientific press. And during the COVID-19, we have seen how much that was influencing. We have a very French famous medical doctor called uh, Raoul in France, in Marseille, who was clearly uh, an, an illustration of, of those incestuous links. <clears throat> Among the other opponents was uh, Claude Bernard, who is the founder of experimental medicine. And for him, alcohol was formed by a subtle ferment outside of life. But um, Marcelin, Marcelin Berthelot uh, published some posthumous uh, notes uh, of uh, Claude Bernard. And uh, to those um, notes, a pastor uh, felt that he had to um, make uh, this publication, so examen critique uh, de, de, des travaux uh, posthumes de Claude Bernard sur la fermentation. And he wrote the following. The question of the soluble ferment is settled. It does not exist. Bernard deleted himself. But Pasteur is wrong. And the one who was clearly the precursor and who was right is Antoine Béchamp. He began his work on fermentation in 1854 and presented his work on the subject in 1867 in a book entitled about the circulation of carbon in nature and the intermediaries of this circulation. This is the book. In it, Béchamp demonstrated that he had understood everything about fermentation before Pasteur and better than him, he wrote. Oh, I'm stuck. Thank you. I'm stuck, so you will uh, have to just wave. <laughs> yeah. So he, he wrote, the substance that brings about this transformation, I can't isolate it. I've named it zymes. Zymes are pure chemical agents produced by a living being. Ensible ferments are recognized being, and their chemical action is of the physiological order. So he was really the, the, the first one to, to understand that. Next. Now let's move to the, another field of, act, uh, of research, was the research on wine disease. On uh, July 1863, he was called by Colonel Ildefonse Favé, who was the aide de camp of the Emperor Napoleon III, to, uh, who suggested the name of Pasteur for a study on wine disease. In fact, of course, as you can imagine, 
producing wine and selling wine it was a major business in France. The problem is that was that those wine arrived in foreign countries, especially in UK, as completely altered. So that was a major problem for the market and for the business. Next. So uh, Pasteur uh, said, uh, agreed to do that. He asked to receive some pomar. For those who know a bit of the French wine, it's not bad wine. And uh, some Volnay. Of course, the, the, the wine from his area, the, 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 uh, white, uh, the, the wine of Arbois and the Gros Plan du Pays Nantais, which is not that good, but, uh, <laughs> but still. Next. And the main effort of Pasteur was to bring the microscope to study the wines. And uh, these are the drawings uh, of Pasteur. I did not make the translation because it's a bit difficult. It was the name of the different diseases of the wine, la cessance, la tourne, la graisse, l'amertume. And each time he recognized that there were different microbes that were contaminating these different uh, wines. Next. So he understood for this four, uh, that these four undesirable microbes were present in wine, had been introduced by man before bottling wine, and he proposed the principle of, of pasteurization. Next. Here we, we see a, this cartoon uh, made with uh, showing Pasteur with his wife in the train bringing back wine branches from Arbois uh, for his study on, uh, on wine. So he uh, obtained his patent on pasteurization on April 1st, 1865, and that was to uh, heat the wines to prevent there from, from disease. Next. Was he the first one? The answer is no. And uh, in fact, the, 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 the idea came to Nicolas Appert, so it's another uh, French per, uh, citizen. In fact, he was a confectioner, and he's the one to whom we do, we, um, we, uh, who invented the way of making preserved. So it's, uh, Appert published L'Art de Conserver pendant plusieurs années toutes les substances animales et végétales, and he published it, a series of books for the different years, the first one being in 1810. And the next, next one, next slide, uh, being in 1831, for the first time, he considered the wines and he uh, proposed to uh, heat the wines. By the way, uh, pasteurization of milk was uh, made by a German scientist many years later. So Pasteur uh, published uh, his studies on, on wines, next. But he also study, uh, made studies on vinegar and next on beer, next. About Weinegger, uh, next, he went to Orléans, which was a city where most of the, uh, the, the, the factories of Weinegger were, were made, and he made the uh, observation that the, the, the Weinegger were possible thanks to this, uh, path this uh, organism, Mycoderma aceti, but he made a major observation, once again, thanks to the microscope, that those, uh, the problems uh, of those uh, Weinegger makers was that there was a contamination with anguille anguillule, which were a kind of, of parasites. Next. Then uh, went the, uh, happened the war between France and Prussia in 1870, and he had to move from Paris in, in, in south of France and went to close to Clermont-Ferrand in Chamalières and started to work on the beer, on the fabrication of, of beer. Next. Then he went to London to the white bread breweries, uh, and here we see um, Louis Pasteur in white bread's laboratory. And once again, he was one of the very first ones to propose to the use of microscope to study uh, the problem uh, of beers. Next. And then finally, he, put a, he, he obtained a patent on that, which was published uh, on June 1871. And in his patent, next, he wrote, I want beers made with my process to beer in France, the name National Revenge. <laughs> National Revenge beer. And this is an uh, illustration of, again, his, Germano, his Germanophobia. And for him, it was very important. By the way, uh, Joseph Meister was coming from Alsace, and Alsace at that time was from G in Germany. So that's why for Pasteur, a very important uh, event. Next. He went also in Meurthe Moselle, in Jules Tourtel uh, breweries, next, and also in, uh, in Copenhagen, in, in Carlsberg, and uh, you can find the statue of Louis Pasteur in Carlsberg's in, in uh, factory. 
Uh, by the way, uh, Jean-Baptiste, who I've been told before, was a diplomat uh, in Copenhagen at that time. Next. Oh, it's working again. It's working again. <laughs> Thank you for your efforts. <laughs> Uh, by, by the way, to finish with the, the work on, on fermentation, uh, Pasteur brought plots of vineyard, and which is uh, Claude Rosière, and you can even buy a bottle of wine with the, the, the picture of Pasteur. But he, he made, honestly, a very clever uh, experiment. He, so he, he put a bunch of grapes uh, wrapped in cotton cotton. So you see here the, 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 the plant of of the, with the grapes, and so you see some are free and some are wrapped uh, in, in cotton, cotton, uh, cotton, cotton. And then he showed that those who were freely exposed to air could allow making wine, where those were protected from the environment, so that means from the germs from outside, there was no possibility to make wines from with, with those. Next. I got it. So, of course, a great... Um, Effort was the, the work of refutation of spontaneous generation and ending to the germ theory. But once again, there were precursors. There were some people, of course, who did not make any demonstration, but who had the intuition. And the most amazing are these uh, uh, Roman uh, Veron or Greek Gallien who were already thinking that probably disease were caused by elements, of course, not known at that time, uh, of that were ca causing the infectious disease. And of course, uh, many others contributed for Castor, who was unknown from Pasteur, but one of the main contributors was Lazzaro Spallanzani. And this painting is in fact in the main dining room of Louis Pasteur. Yeah, a, a Pasteur who had a lot, we heard this uh, before with Edel Felt, but not only with Edel Felt, he had a lot of connection with many painters, and he asked to, to have the, the painting of, La of Spallanzani. So, in 1861, he published uh, Les Corpuscules Organisés qui existent dans l'atmosphère, and this famous uh, swan, uh, uh, swan neck uh, flask, and adding to this uh, theory of, of germs. And you see here uh, Louis Pasteur uh, on the Mer de Glace, testing uh, his uh, flask, opening the flask. Uh, on the Mer de Glace, so in the Alps, in the mountain, showing that the air there is free of microbes and that there was no contamination as in comparison to the same flask open in Paris, for example. Of course, there were opponents, uh, and the, the main opponent was uh, Félix Archimède Pouchet. So for the, the poor guy, it's not changed because he made more or less the same experiment than Pasteur. In the Pyrenees, I don't think that makes a difference with the Alps. And in fact, it was even higher, so we can think that the air was even purer. And uh, it came to the concept of heterogeny, which is in fact the, the concept of spontaneous generation. And in 1864, he published a new book on the spontaneous generation. Uh, amusingly, he signed his book to Gustave Flaubert. And here we have a letter of Gustave Flaubert to uh, Pouchet, saying how he was admiring the science proposed by Pouchet. So it's, it's interesting to see how the, there was a connection between uh, the, all this intelligentsia. But finally, on February uh, 20, 1865, the Commission of the Academy of Science ruled in favor of Louis Pasteur against Félix Pouchet, and it was over the concept of spontaneous generation was solved. And clearly, the uh, GM theory ended to a main uh, consequence is the, the one made by uh, Joseph Lister. In 1865, he learned Louis Pasteur's theory that microorganisms cause infection. So using fennel as an antiseptic, and here we have this uh, machine that he was using to spray all around the, 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 the body who was under uh, surgery, and he reduced the mortality of amputated patients to 15% in four years, compared to 45 to 50 persons who previously died of sepsis. And this is his first publication in 1876 in the British Medical Journal where uh, Lister proposed the antiseptic pr principle for the practice of surgery, and that was made with a boy of 11 years who had, was badly uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, um, uh, on the leg. Uh, maybe
Maybe you know this painting. This was made by, uh, in 1902. So it, interestingly, that was the jubilee of Louis Pasteur for his 17th anniversary. And the painting was made 10 years later. And in fact, some people who are on, on the painting were not present during that jubilee. But most importantly, uh, here you see the, the Sally Carnot, the French president, with Louis Pasteur. And the, the person who is exactly in the middle of the painting is not Pasteur, it's Lister. And Lister is, is getting up some few steps to congratulate Pasteur. Another key work of Pasteur was the silkworm disease. He was called by Jean-Baptiste Dumas to inv investigate silkworm disease, but he didn't know anything about it. So he went to meet uh, uh, Henri Fabre, who was an entomologist, and here is what uh, Fabre wrote. Ignoring caterpillar, cocoon, chrysalis, metamorphosis, Pasteur came to regenerate the silkworm. The ancient gymnasts presenting themselves necked to the fight. Genius fighter against the scourge of the manioneries, he also came to the battle necked. That is to say, without the simplest notion about the insect to get out of the puril. I was stunned. Better than that, I was amazed. Once again, we meet Antoine Béchamp. Antoine Béchamp in 1865, and as soon as 1865, said the pebrine, that was the name of the disease, was a parasitic disease. During that same period of time, Pasteur said, no, it's a constitutive disease. Till 1867, finally, Pasteur admitted it was an infectious disease. In 1870, he published his book on the study on the disease of the silkworm. Uh, and in fact, Pasteur was using the method proposed by Emilio Cornelia in 1856 to uh, make selection of the diseased worms and, and, and eggs to uh, um, avoid the... I can give you five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> so this is the, the statue of, of, of the savior of, of sericulture. Pastor wrote, this poor Mr. Béchamp is at this moment one of the most curious examples of the influence of preconceived ideas gradually turned into fixed idea. All these assertions are so biased that I wonder if he has ever observed more than 10 silkworms in his life. And Béchamp said, I am the precursor of Pasteur, exactly as the robber is the precursor of the fortune of the happy and insolent thieves who taunt and slander them. <laughs> so I, I will move very fastly, uh, just because I wanted to, to at least mention one Finnish scientist. So that's why this is an important slide. Uh, it's Carl, uh, Robert Hestrom about purpural sepsis, because in fact, uh, he was thinking it was due to miasma, but uh, he, he, he considered that the, the, the disease was contagious, and that was uh, very important. So the two other key persons were Victor Fels and uh, Leon Coes, who uh, showed that deadly bacteria are present in the blood of patients. And that work, published in La Gazette Médicale de Strasbourg, was published in 1869. Ten years later, ten years later, Pasteur published the same thing that indeed a woman who died of puerperal fe uh, fever uh, had bacteria in, in their blood. And he suggested the use of boric acid to wash the genital tract. So let's finish with three minutes. Uh, let's they say four because one per vaccine. Uh, <laughs> with, with the four vaccines of, of Louis Pasteur. So the first is the full cholera. So they, they used uh, virulent pastorella, which was killing hen. And because vacation are very important in France, everything is stopped during vacation time. So once they came back from vacation, they took back their virulent pastorella culture, re-injected in hen, uh, and the hen survived. So they came, they did the, in, the, the experiment that they took the back this hen and re-prepared virulent pastorella in, in uh, culture, and the hen survived. And they came to the conclusion that in the field of observation, chance only favors prepared minds. But this is a fairy tale. And once again, this is just what is our, our, our in, has been told, but it's not the, the reality. The second vaccine is on, on tracks. 
The precursor is Henri Toussaint, who made the key vaccine using fennel to attenuate the bacteria and uh, injected in sheep and, and protected the sheep. The most known experiment was made a year later. The so-called Puy Le Fort demonstration where Pasteur was successfully uh, addressing uh, the, the problem. But there was no information about the nature of the vaccine. And it was thought, at least it's what Pasteur was uh, suggesting, that uh, like the, the fall cholera, it was, the attenuation was made by air and by oxygen. And in fact, the, the, the top secret, the use of patio, pa, potassium dichromate was, uh, let's mean according to uh, Toussaint, I mean using an antiseptic, a potassium dichromate was in fact the way to prepare the vaccine. The third vaccine was on pig erysipelas. Uh, they changed their mind in terms of preparing the vaccine and make uh, attenuation from rabbit to rabbit. And of course, Pasteur was successful uh, and got his statue. And of course, the most known is the rabies vaccine. Once again, there was a precursor. It's Pierre Victor Galtier, who was the first to vaccinate animals and protect those animals. And a very important precursor was Pierre-Henri Dubois, because he was the one who discovered that rabies was getting to the brain through the nervous system. At that time, people of the pastor team were looking for the, for the virus within the bloodstream. And as Pierre Dubois said, there cannot be preventive treatment with attenuated viruses without prior culture of rabies virus and no culture of the latter without knowledge of the tissue or organs where the virus resides. And indeed, you have seen that painting by Edel Fett, and this is indeed rabbit uh, spinal cord. The idea came from Emile Roux. The addition of potash to accelerate the, the drying process was made by, by, by Pasteur. In fact, they, they were fighting each other at that time. You have seen those. And this is again the legend. Joseph Meister, the first person to be vaccinated, and Jean-Baptiste Jupil, the second one. The legend, Joseph Meister and Jean-Baptiste Jupil became later on the um, gatekeeper of Institut Pasteur. And Joseph Meister uh, killed himself when the Nazi entered in Paris. By the way, uh, Jean-Baptiste Jean Jupil who has his statue uh, in the gardens of Institut Pasteur, has never been attacked by a dog. He's the one who attacked the dog. <laughs> so in fact, the reality, again, coming from the laboratory notebooks, is that in fact, the very first to be vaccinated was this sir, Mr. Girard, who was at the Necker Hospital. He became very sick after the vaccine, and the uh, hospital authority decided to stop the vaccination process. And finally, the, the guy left uh, alive. And the, the second person to be vaccinated, and this is in the, in the notebook of Pasteur, is uh, this uh, little girl, Juliette Antoinette Pougon, 11 years old. Unfortunately, it was too late. She, she died the following day after the, 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 the vaccine. So I would like to end with two quotations of Pasteur. Science knows no border because knowledge belongs to humanity. And I think this is the pandemic is an example of that uh, humanity working together to fight the, the pandemic and the microbes. He said also another um, statement, science and peace will tri triumph over ignorance and war. Unfortunately, it was wrong. And the events in, in, in Ukraine are just showing that unfortunately, we are not yet there. And I'm sorry to have been too long, and I still have a few things about, but uh, you can find my uh, more information in this, uh, in this paper just published uh, this year. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> oh.